and I find another penny on the street, I could run an ad tomorrow if anybody had funded for me and say, Ross Perot just doubled his net worth, right? Campaigning right to the end, the candidates with 24 hours to win your vote. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. Good to have you with us. I'm Joan Lennon. It is Monday, November 2nd, and this horse race is finally nearing the finish line. Tomorrow, and you will decide. The stretch they that, come. That's all right. <laughs> You're going to be deciding, though, tomorrow who's going to lead the country for the next four years. So we're going to spend this half hour. How far are there some other business? Too? Candidates will and should be doing to get your vote on this final day of campaigning. Meanwhile, Spencer's got the weather for us. And no one's going to vote. A like storm will produce major snowfall in Minnesota yeah. and the Dakotas over plus or minus three points. Now, that poll is the most favorable for Bill Clinton of the polls that came out over the weekend. Other polls find Clinton's lead within the margin of error. That's why it will be a busy last day of campaigning. President Bush will make stops today in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, and Louisiana. Now, yesterday at a stop in Stratford, Connecticut, he had nonstop assaults on his Democratic opponent. Being attacked on character by Governor Clinton is like being called ugly by a frog. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Now, Clinton isn't letting up on his verbal assaults or isn't letting his verbal assaults slow him down. He'll be on a nonstop, last-ditch stomp for votes. Look at the list where he's going to be today until noon tomorrow. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Missouri, Kentucky, Texas, New Mexico, and finally a sunrise rally in Colorado on Election Day. Yesterday, he was in New Jersey for a large rally. Clinton has been losing his voice, but he's promising to win the election. I have all but lost my voice to make sure we can find America on November 3rd. Ross Perot has one more campaign appearance planned. He will speak at a noontime rally today in Dallas. After that, he will only be seen on primetime network commercials tonight. Ross Perot ended his coast-to-coast -coast campaign swing with a stop in Santa Clara, California. He also went after Clinton in an infomercial called Deep Voodoo Chicken Feathers and the American five Dream. Jobs in the last 12 years created in Arkansas has been created in the poultry business. If we decide to take this level of business creating capability nationwide, we'll all be plucking chickens for a living. Perot picked up the endorsement of the Greensburg Tribune Review over the weekend. Perot's wife, of course, Margot, was raised in Greensburg. Polls on Pennsylvania's Senate race are also showing some fluctuating numbers this morning. A Republican survey research firm did a poll that finds Arlen Specter with a 10-point lead over challenger Lynn Yackel. The numbers in that poll, 48 to 38. But a recent eyewitness news poll finds it much closer, in fact, too close to call. Specter with 44% in our poll, Yackel ahead by only a percentage point. 11% of those polled undecided, and there's a margin of error in this poll of plus or minus three percentage points. Both Specter and Yackel know how close the vote will be. That's why they both spent yesterday campaigning. Specter's first stop was at the Pittsburgh Greater Faith Tabernacle Church, the church of Councilman Dwayne Darkins. Darkins is supporting Specter, and he encouraged the incumbent senator to talk politics during the morning worship services yesterday. There's the issue of putting 10 million Americans back to work. Yes, yes. Yes. There's, the issue, there's the issue of affordable health care for all yes. Americans, yes. including long-term care for senior citizens. Right. right. Let's hear it. Yes. Specter's opponent spent her Sunday campaigning in the eastern part of the state. Yackel visited several black churches and then aligned herself with Clinton during a rally in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. During a TV interview, she denied her campaign funds are running out. Um, no, we have been right on target. I lent the campaign some money just because of cash needs, but I expect to get it back as I got back the money I lent in the primary. It was Millie who taught him to roll over and play dead on domestic policy. Earlier in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, Clinton managed a brief speech that stripped down his message to his most basic campaign theme. This election is a race between hope and fear, between the courage to change and the comfort of the status quo. In the waning hours of this long campaign, Clinton seems weary but confident, even jubilant. He's no doubt been studying the electoral college map that shows him maintaining a decided advantage in the all-important state-by-state contests. 
For Clinton, the most important states are Ohio, Michigan, and New Jersey. The Clinton camp believes if they can carry just one of those states, they'll be in a very good position to win this election tomorrow. That, of course, assumes that they hold on to what they consider to be their base, that base including the state of Pennsylvania, where Clinton is starting his, his last day 4,000-mile campaign blitz this morning. Mike. I'm going to say, Ron, with a campaign that seems to be as confident as the Clinton campaign is, why work it so hard at the end? The search for a mandate, perhaps? Well, I think uh, while they believe they're ahead in most of these states that they're going to be visiting, they're narrowly ahead in many of them. They want to nail that down and be sure that they can uh, win those states when the, when the balloting begins tomorrow. All right, Ron, thanks very much. Ron Claiborne live in Philadelphia for us this morning. The third presidential candidate, Ross Perot, lashed out at both of his rivals over the weekend. Perot attacked both men on their economic records and on some other issues as well. ABC's Linda Patillo has that report. Perot called this his two-minute drill, a final push to win an election that the polls say is out of his grasp. With each stop, he stepped up the attack on his opponents. First, Clinton, in an apparent reference to Clinton's admission he tried marijuana as a student. Do you believe that it's appropriate to have senior government officials who have used drugs? <laughs> it's up to you. Then Bush. Bush created Noriega in Panama. Then, then, then he got out of control and Americans had to fight and die to take him out. It was just one week ago that Perot raised public doubts by making allegations he refused to prove about Republican dirty tricks. In California, he leveled a new charge. Do you understand that the Democrats and Republicans pay people to come to their rallies? Don't you find it interesting that everybody in the press knows that and you and I don't read it in the paper every time they have a rally? Fascinating. Later at a brief news conference, a tired and testy Perot refused to back up his statement. Jeez, look, look, I'm too old and too tired to put up with this kind of little ping pong stuff. Perot's strategy from here on out appears to be to take out his six-shooter and fire at everybody from the media to his opponents. And at least his opponents aren't firing back for fear of alienating any wavering Perot supporters who might cast their ballots their way. Mike? It seems to be an interesting shift in the last day, though, because he's been firing away at Mr. Bush fairly regularly, but he hasn't gone after Governor Clinton on the character issue all that strongly before, has he? No, he hasn't, and he made this first mention about drug use in his 30... A minute commercials that are that aired last night and will air again tonight he really aims hard at Clinton and spends most of the time attacking Clinton's record in Arkansas and he'll repeat those programs tonight and in effect get the last word by buying time late at night okay Linda thanks very much Linda Patillo live for us this morning in San Francisco finally big sports story to tell you about We're on the subject of long distance I'm sad Good morning to you I look great up there Five nuns shot to death last week in Liberia. $300 in late payments as a result. Of she could do it in an efficient fashion. So crush resistance miles. And it was the same. Obviously have a great spot in my heart for that. So just remember, every day and every way, uh, each little step, we get closer and closer. And soon we will find a way, because that's the way it is in mankind. We just eventually will wipe it out sooner the better. Happy birthday this morning. How sweet it is. Obviously raining here in Washington. It's raining in Detroit and Boston. Oh, back on down into uh, Utah, thunderstorm storm here. This one came down out of the Rockies of, of the Mississippi. We'll have a look at the election day forecast, so don't go too far away. Here's what's happening in your world even as we speak. Good morning. I'm Bill Cardo with the Carnegie Science Center weather forecast. Lots of clouds in our forecast for the next uh, three or four days. We have a front moving through a couple of fronts, warm front, then a cold front. Mild temperatures first half of the week, cold second half of the week. For today, umbrellas and raincoats, cloudy, breezy with showers, maybe a thunder shower, 54 for high, more the same overnight tonight, and more the same tomorrow on Election Day. We may dry out tomorrow afternoon. Umbrellas and raincoats through Thursday. Now here's Brian. <laughs> okay, Willie, thanks. 710 now, and on close-up this morning, Election Eve. Though the poll numbers may vary, the last-minute strategies of Democrats and Republicans do not. Both hope to hit as many key states as possible in the final 24 hours. Robert Teeter is chairman of President Bush's re-election campaign. He's in Short Hills, New Jersey. Mickey Cantor is Governor Clinton's campaign chairman. He's at our NBC News Bureau in Little Rock. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Brian. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. We've agreed to take turns doing this. So let me start with you, Mr. Teeter, if I might. The polls that we've seen uh, reflect the popular national vote. The electoral picture is less favorable to, to the president. What do your numbers show on that front? How do you stand? 
Uh, well, we think there are a, a large number of states that are very competitive. We've been gaining uh, ground uh, really since the debates. And uh, we, uh, certainly the presence of a third candidate, Mr. Perot, in it makes more states competitive than you would usually have. And uh, we think the number of normal Republican-based states, uh, where we're ahead now, we've been gaining three or four of those states every day for the last week. And so uh, we think that uh, we go into t tomorrow's election with uh, 25 or 30, 35 states, very competitive and well enough for us to win. Very competitive doesn't uh, necessarily have the president in front. In states where you show the president leading in your own tracking numbers, um, how many electoral votes do you get up to? Uh, I think there are uh, something of 130 or so uh, right now, uh, 14 or 16 states uh, that make up about 130 or 35 uh, electoral votes and uh, probably another 60 or 65 uh, where they're either normally Republican states or where we're even. So you still need a turnaround in the last 24 hours in order to get to 270? Well, what we need is exactly what you have in every close presidential election. Uh, you have to get those last 50, 60, 70 electoral votes out of the close battleground states. Those are the states... Uh, those northern industrial states uh, where the president's going today, uh, we're in one right now here in New Jersey, and uh, every close presidential election comes down to those last six or eight states where you've got to get 50 or 60 electoral votes. What primary issues are you looking to stress in these last 24 hours? What are you hoping voters keep in mind in the next 24 hours? Well, the same things, Bryant, that we've uh, tried to get them to keep in mind the last two or three weeks, and we think uh, the same issues always come around at the end of uh, any presidential campaign. Uh, one, there's a very uh, fundamental and different choice between uh, the two candidates in terms of where they take the country economically in the next four years, and most important is the character issue. Uh, every voter knows that they don't know what kind of problems and the toughest problems that any president will deal with over the next four years, and so when it comes right down to it, they think about what is the fundamental character qualities of the person they want in the White House making those judgments for them. Mr. Teeter, haven't you been deprived of that character and trust issue? Uh, most recently by the latest revelations about Iran-Contra and George Bush's true role in it? No, not at all. Uh, Brian, I think uh, every voter knows there's something a little suspect uh, when some story pops up on the Friday before the election about Iran-Contra. But, but this was named in an indictment of a man with whom George Bush served under Brian, Ronald Reagan. It, as you know, and as almost everybody in the press knows, if they've read the congressional testimony on those, the, the Iran-Contra, there was nothing new revealed Friday whatsoever. The president, as he has said many times, has answered hundreds and his staff thousands of questions. Uh, the special independent counsel in the Congress has spent 30 or 40 million dollars investigating it. There was not one thing new in, in that story Friday that has, was not there in the congressional report that had been public for uh, months. Is Iran-Contra the reason the president canceled all interviews that he had scheduled up until tomorrow? No, uh, the president didn't cancel them. Uh, the president uh, did interviews yesterday, and the president has a string of interviews that he's doing today. What do you think, uh, Mr. Teter, Ross Perot's impact is going to be tomorrow? Well, you never know, uh, Brian, but the, the uh, basic impact is that he's made many states more competitive. And uh, I think the second characteristic of a third candidate in the race is they always make the race more volatile and, make, uh, and give you a lot more late decision-making. Uh, I think we're going to see more people uh, making up their minds in the last uh, 24, 48, 72 hours in this race <coughs> when we wake up next Wednesday and look at those exit polls than we've ever seen. All right. Robert Teeter, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Let's go to Mickey Cantor. Uh, Mickey, you've said that when a, when a campaign's ahead, you worry about everything. Just, yeah, how worried right. are, just how worried are you this morning? Not very. Uh, we have a day today, a 27-hour day, Brian, as you know, eight states, nine cities, and Senator Gore is going to be in seven states. But this is not about electoral votes or campaign days. It's about America's future. It's about creating jobs. It's about educating our children. It's about protecting our environment. It's about doing something about a failed government. And that's what Bill Clinton has done with this country, and I think we can move forward together. We've seen the readout on the public polls. What's your private polling show? Uh, it shows about the same. Uh, Bill Clinton's moving ahead very quickly. Uh, we feel good about it, but it's not about polls right now, Brian, even though we're ahead and getting further ahead. That's not the point. The point is America's future. It's about change. It's about our economy. We've got to do something, and American people have made up their minds. It's time to move George Bush out of the White House and put Bill Clinton there. The schedule for Governor Clinton that we've seen is a pretty rigorous one. It has him in, in uh, about eight states in, in three different regions um, of the country today. Why are you still pushing so hard? Because he said he was going to work his heart out with the American people to bring change to the country, and he's not going to stop. Uh, this is the last day. Uh, he has worked now for 14 months to uh, bring bring his message to the American people, and now's not the time to uh, stop that effort. Uh, he is a 
hard worker, as you know, he's committed, he's courageous, he's shown that through the primaries in this general election, and his, his, no one can take that away from him. His voice prevented him from speaking uh, yesterday in Pennsylvania and Ohio. What kind of shape is his laryngitis in now? It's, it's better today. Uh, he's worked so hard and he has his allergies, as you know. Uh, uh, that, that keeps him back somewhat, but it didn't stop him last night. It won't stop him today. A couple of the same questions I asked Bob Teeter. What is sure. it particularly you want voters to focus on the last 24 hours and tomorrow in the voting booth? Well, America's future, Amer uh, change. You know, can you imagine waking up on Wednesday morning as an American and, <laughs> and seeing George Bush with four more years, four more years of trickle-down economics and 10 million un unemployed and 35 million without health insurance versus waking up Wednesday morning and seeing a new day in America, uh, President-elect Clinton and a Vice President-elect Gore. Just think about it, and I think Americans can make that choice. And just how uncertain does the presence of Ross Perot make tomorrow's uh, uh, projections? None. No uncertainty whatsoever. None at all? None. Well, we'll see what Arson Swindle has to say about that. He's with okay. Katie right now. Okay, Mickey. Thank, thank you. you. Katie? Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Brian. Orson Swindle became executive director of United We Stand America just before Ross Perot re-entered the presidential race. This morning, he's at Perot headquarters in Dallas. Good morning, Mr. Swindle. Good morning, Katie. Jim Cummins, who's covering Mr. Pro, said he appeared uh, more like a conventional candidate this weekend. And in fact, he was, as you know, stumping in Florida, Texas, California, and Kansas. He's done very little of that during this campaign. Why start now? Kitty, as I explained repeatedly, I think it's on record pretty well, that, uh, you know, we got started late in the campaign on the 1st of October, and we had a lot of work to do for the TV commercials and also the debates. And I made the statement in those early weeks that uh, the last couple of weeks we would be out uh, around the country, and that's exactly what we're doing. We got off to a little late start, but uh, we're doing it. Mr. Perot chose Texas, Florida, and California. Is that because those states are particularly high in electoral votes? No, they're because they're the areas where we have particularly good support, but we have support all over the country, and I think you're going to see it on Election Day. Mr. Swindle, uh, during the weekend, Mr. Perot talked about a 50-state slam dunk, but right now he's positioned anywhere from 20 to 30 points behind in the polls. So do you think a 50-state slam dunk is realistic? Well, I don't think we're going to carry 50 states, Katie, but I think we're going to carry an awful lot. And I think you folks keep relying on polls that look at uh, the uh, likely voters or whatever the term is. And, uh, you know, we find that the likely voters apparently are defined as those who voted in the 88 general election and the primaries, uh, you know, that's a heavily biased uh, segment of people. There are an awful lot of people out here that would not be polled in that thing. And a lot of people are newly registered. And we have a, uh, a groundswell of support out there that I think is going to have a heck of an effect on the uh, campaign. So with the current polls, you think that Mr. Perot's supporters are undercounted? Oh, I have no doubts they're undercounted and unrepresented. I don't think the polls are uh, accurate at all. You said that Mr. Perot will take, I, I think you said several states. Can you tell me what states you think he'll take? I just said, uh, you just said uh, California, Florida, and Texas, they're good uh, beginners, but uh, we're looking at, at as many states as we can cover nationwide, and again, we have an unrepresented uh, group of people out there, and uh, we did our own sampling and, and uh, polling here the, this last week, uh, and we polled over 100,000 people, and the election, re uh, the results we got was 29% for Clinton, 28% Perot, 25% Bush, and about 18% undecided. I think that 18% is a key figure. So you do think he'll take, Mr. Perot will take Texas, California, and Florida, is what you're saying? Kitty, I think I've said that twice, as a matter of fact. Well, actually, you've said it once. I was just asking you about his campaigning in those three states. I would like to ask you, Mr. Swindle, about uh, the... The change in attitude Mr. Perot seems to have regarding Governor Clinton, he sort of has had a hands-off policy, it seems to me, in terms of criticizing Governor Clinton. I know during the debate he says uh, his governing uh, of Arkansas is irrelevant but, la irrelevant, but last night in his political commercial, he really attacked uh, Governor Clinton and his record in Arkansas. So why the turnaround in terms of his strategy toward the governor? Katie, I think it goes back to truth. That's what we've been trying to bring about in this campaign, get the issues discussed. And Mr. Clinton has uh, spent hours and hours talking to American people about what a grand job he's done in Arkansas. I think the truth needs to be known. He's been a disaster in Arkansas. You know, he talked, uh, uh, Mickey was talking a little while ago about the great refreshing change. You know, Bill Clinton represents traditional tax and spend liberals. Their solution to jobs, uh, education, everything is government control and more government spending and government involvement and all that. It doesn't work. It never has. And that's what you're going to get with Clinton. Uh, he is not the solution for change. He parrots uh, Ross Perot's ideas quite uh, nicely, but he is not the, the, the vehicle for change. Uh, the only way we'll change this country is through Ross Perot. 
Robert Teeter says that your candidate makes the race more volatile, and I'm going to ask you a quick question about the polls, even though you don't like them. According to the polls, one-third of all Perot supporters say they might change their mind on Election Day. If they do, who do you think they'll go to, Clinton or Bush? Well, let's talk about the, the changing of mind. You know, it had been quite evident there's a major effort on the part of the president, certainly Mr. Clinton, and even you folks in the media, to suggest that our supporters, if they vote for Mr. Perot, are wasting the vote. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're standing for our conviction. That's what this country was based upon and built mm -hmm. upon. And if the, if the people who support Mr. Perot will get out and support Mr. Perot, we're going to take the country back, and we will win this election. All right. Orson Swindle, thanks so much for talking with us this morning. It's 721 and we're back in a moment, but first, this is Today on NBC. State Treasurer Catherine Baker Knoll has created thousands of new jobs. Through uh, Mayfair Diner up in uh, Philadelphia. You can see he's drawn quite a bit of crowd, 724. On George Bush is in New Jersey, right? Short Hills, New Jersey. Yeah, we're back in just a moment. More ahead after this. Ultima is color. In Philadelphia, for 10 years, you turned Taste that. makes it just better. On the traffic, we've had a few problems this morning, right, Neil? Well, we sure have, Adam, but uh, things have really stabilized. However, it's become a very, very heavy rush hour. The Parkway East is at the 22 split at Churchill. Parkway West has reached the top of Green Tree Hill. 279 is holding around McKnight to venture. Roll <laughs> Coverage is coming off about a 20-point drop. Also, it's slow moving now between Ensign and Bowsman to the Liberty Tunnel. Looks like Allegheny River Boulevard is slow at Sandy Creek going toward Nadine. Verona Road approaching uh, Kohalo and Sandy Creek. You have about a three-light delay. So everything has slowed down very rapidly, including 28 from the bypass to the 31st Street Bridge. Adam, back to you. The old slow down Monday morning trick. <laughs> Here's the weather story, and that has been a contributing factor, probably, mm. right, Susan? Yes, the rain is light, but it's out there. Let's take a look. Right. Now, choose from the warning signs of an asthma attack and what to do. Unknown writers can spend a lot of time peddling their wares to often cynical publishers. It was discovered off Middle Street in Fineview. We make your car look new. Right. Childhood stars, today at 9 on Geraldo. Good morning to you. It's 726 on this Monday, November 2nd here on Channel 11. I'm Della Cruz. A check on the forecast shortly with Bill Cardell. First, rush hour with Metro traffic. Two points of slowing on the inbound side of Route 28 this morning if you're coming in from out of the north side. It is uh, heavy and slow from up around the Highland Park Bridge. You get off your brakes after you clear the Aetna Bypass. On them again, though, Della, once you get down around the Mill Valley Interchange. Halton Bridge northbound leaving the Oakmont area solid with bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. 279, a little clotted now at the now-closed Venture Street off-ramps. With the latest on traffic, Carol. Finelli, Channel 11 News. An accident between a tractor trailer and a car turns... 15230. At least one person was... ...while she was walking... Thank you, Stuffy! ...tree, but most... ...neighboring house. Would he tell us of that kind... Coming up on Channel 11 News at noon and tonight on first... So ...new information on the... ...pending notification of the victim's family. A Pittsburgh firefighter is the target of an East End shooting over... In the Thomas Santoriello was parked outside fire station number 15 along the Homewood East Liberty border last evening. He says a man came up to his car, questioned him, then started shooting. I wouldn't trust him at all to be commander in chief. He dodged the draft. He can't be straight on anything. Bill Clinton seems to be for everything that everybody asks for. I think if there's a pattern and I, I just don't trust Bill Clinton. I can't uh, trust anything that he says. Mm-mm-mm. It will be continued tomorrow. It should be an interesting day. And what will the weather be like? Tomorrow? Well, let's take a look. It won't be bad for elections. After today, some rain and in the mid-50s will be up to 60 degrees for Election Day and rain-free except for just a few showers in a few areas. Then Wednesday and Thursday, cooler... ...will mark the savings, 25, 30... There's a way to virtually guarantee a safer system. Patty Panicha, CNN report. With the Carnegie Science Center weather forecast through the Thursday. Break American and Japanese baseball players go to bat in an international competition. We'll have a look. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kathy Marshall. I'm Leon. All the way down to Texas, Oklahoma. These classes throughout this country. Through Friday, and we have a couple of. Front in second, and Perot on the rail third. Here comes Clinton around the far turn to take the lead, followed by Bush and Perot. Down the stretch they come racing for the wire. Clinton with the lead followed by Bush and Perot. And at the wire, it's Clinton. <laughs> by the way, the dog representing Bill Clinton was the only female in the race. Well, it'll be a three-dog night tomorrow. And you know, when I was a boy, I was told anyone could be president. And now I believe it. Back in a moment.
I tell you, I've got to start living the simple life. Is this the simple life? No, I've got too much to worry about. Man-eating beasts inventing the wheel. Cholesterol. Cholesterol? Yeah, you think I want to see somebody in my family have a heart attack? We're not Neanderthals. Keep up with the times. Watch your family's blood cholesterol level. Eat a diet low in saturated fats and cholesterol. After all, you know what happened to the dinosaurs. That was cholesterol? Always hot. 24. Ernie creates negative. In the next 36 hours. In fact, it all starts with a call to... on Eyewitness News tonight. And that's what's happening tonight. He's only ever cared about one thing, getting himself elected. He's run for office 16 times in the last 30 years, changing his story with each election. He's voted for trickle-down economics, voted for tax breaks for millionaires, and he's run one of the most negative campaigns in the state's history. But in the end, he'll only be remembered for one thing. Did you conclude that Judge Thomas was guilty of sexual harassment? Twelve years is enough. McConnell's Mill State Park. For kids' sake! <laughs> You're watching KDK TV 2. Now, live from Gateway Center, this is a one-day-to-victory gathering, he's calling it. But polls in New Jersey continue to show uh, Bill Clinton uh, winning that state. Meanwhile, Bill Clinton is up in Pennsylvania, where polls also show him winning. He's at the Mayfair Diner, as we told you, greeting a, a crowd that's come out to watch him have breakfast, I guess. These guys do eat on the run. They probably eat a lot of junk. Supply may lead to a night rally in his adopted hometown of Houston, Texas. Bill Clinton's on a brutal round-the-clock eight-state tour through the nation's battleground. And Ross Perot sticks to familiar ground, hosting a Dallas rally. Clinton appears to be breaking away from the dead heat in the polls. The latest CNN USA Today Gallup poll of likely voters shows his lead over President Bush has grown to eight points. Ross Perot trails with 14 percent. When an undecided voters are, are factored in, Clinton shows a 12-point lead. The estimate gives Clinton 49% support compared with the president's 37 and Perot's 14. Bill Clinton isn't taking his lead in the polls for granted. His voice is about the only thing showing signs of slowing down. The Arkansas governor let his saxophone do the talking at a rally in Cherry Hill, New Jersey last night. And across the Midwest, Clinton continued to press forth his message of change. At a get out the vote rally in the Meadowlands, he challenged young voters to fulfill the American dream. This is a very big election, the first election since the end of the Cold War, the election that will chart our course well into the 21st century, the election which will determine whether America will open a bright new vision of opportunity and peace and prosperity and diversity and strength or become the first generation of Americans to do worse than their parents. President Bush is wooing the voters in states he needs to win. Racing through New Jersey and Connecticut yesterday, he targeted Bill Clinton on the issues of character and experience. Charles Bierbauer has more. President Bush left Wisconsin for the last time on this campaign, hoping to defy the odds. Be sure to go to the polls. We are going to show those pundits wrong. We are going to win. But as Bush boarded Air Force One, he could just as well have been muttering about his cooling chances as the turn in the weather. The president had narrowed the gap, but Bush's surge may have ended as several late polls show Clinton's lead widening. As I believe the polls are, have just been totally out of whack, and so I've just driven down on the message. While trying to make last-minute gains in normally Democratic Wisconsin, one of his home states, Connecticut, and the essential industrial battleground of Michigan, Bush has honed that message to his simplest enunciation. Give me your support based on trust, based on character, based on confidence in the United States of America. Bush continues an assault on Clinton's draft explanation. Even today, we have new evidence, an affidavit, that when Governor Clinton first ran for office, his friends used special connections to seize his ROTC file and destroy all others. The Clinton campaign says it's not true. In the closing days, the president has found his own character under scrutiny, a revival of questions about his voice in the Reagan administration arms for hostages deal. It didn't make any difference. People are tired of this. 
The president calls this an unpleasant campaign and continues to complain about media bias. I love a good fight and we're going to take it right to them, right around the media and right to the American people. But campaign strategists concede the president is trailing in most battleground states. And with only one day of campaigning left, Bush has to hope that he can plant enough doubts about Governor Clinton that the voters will change their minds at the last minute. Charles Beaubar, CNN, Stratford, Connecticut. Independent presidential candidate Ross Perot says he's the voter's best choice because he is the only true businessman on the ballot. Perot made several rare campaign appearances yesterday, rallying voters across Southern California. Tonight, he takes to more familiar territory, the airwaves, with spots airing on three networks. In the Golden State yesterday, Perot charged Arkansas has nowhere to go but up after Bill Clinton's governorship. And he said Bush administration policies have fostered a weak economy and a lingering recession. Can we agree that it's time to shop shipping jobs and whole industries around the world? Can we agree that priority one is to put America back to work? Can we agree certainly in Silicon Valley that we need the jobs of the future, not the jobs of yesterday? Can you believe in Silicon Valley that after we created the integrated circuit, now 19 out of 20 that we use in this country come from overseas? The vice presidential running mates are pounding the pavement to earn voters for the tickets. James Stockdale joined Ross Perot yesterday for stops in San Francisco, Long Beach, and San Jose. Al Gore trudged through Michigan and Wisconsin yesterday. The Democrat hit on health care and education reform in the must-win Midwestern states. Dan Quell pushed through 14 states in the past five days and is slated to hit six more today. He's questioned Clinton's faithfulness to his family, his country, and his principles. Quell spends tonight at his parents' Indiana home and will vote in Huntington tomorrow. As the campaign enters its final day, the candidates will deliver their tried and true messages one more time. Those messages have been honed by months of political rhetoric. But critics charge that they seem to avoid some really big urban issues. Bunny Anderson reports. Let me tell you about that one. And part of what we have to say. Thousands of speeches. Is, let's get right down to brass tacks. Millions of words. We can't. I do want to say it. They've sure had a lot to say about a lot. But what about these once burning issues? <laughs> Inner city problems. On the ground. Crime and the war on drugs. Homelessness. These topics have been virtually ignored, critics say, because it would mean campaigning in the inner cities themselves. It will be in areas that have the highest unemployment, the highest crime, the highest drug addiction, the highest teenage pregnancy, the highest poverty. Now, who in the heck wants to campaign in these areas, I ask you? Not the Bush campaign, political analysts say. Not when inner cities traditionally vote Democratic. And not Clinton, they add. Not when he has those votes virtually locked up and has to concentrate time and money on where the most critical votes will be cast this year, the suburbs. Tell that to Richard Kim of Los Angeles. During the riots, his mother was shot in the thigh as vandals burned a family audiovisual business to the ground. This right here used to be where the wall is. Kim says he feels used by the candidates who showed so much concern six months ago but who are now leaving residents to pick up the pieces by themselves. All I can see is basic lip service. Hello, Jim. In a public housing project in Atlanta, Brenda Williams, a single mother of three, says she's losing hope. Crime and drug use are so bad here, she says, her children stay inside unless she's with them. If I hear I don't, I don't know where that bullet might be coming from. It might, you know, it might be a scrape bullet, don't have no name on it. Williams says she's disappointed, angry the candidates aren't concentrating on ways to help Americans like her. Across town, Carl Allen Smith and other homeless men live in makeshift huts with no electricity, no running water, no permanent address, no voter's registration card. They say they feel completely excluded from the political process. Do you think the candidates should be talking more about this issue? Yes, they should. Because there's lots of homeless people. There's a lot of them. And ain't no telling what they think. The campaign say there'll be plenty of time to discuss these issues in depth after the election. Maybe. Bonnie Anderson, CNN, Atlanta. Milan Ponic could be on his way out. Parliamentary sources say the Yugoslav Prime Minister is not likely to survive today's no-confidence vote. Ponic has headed the former Yugoslavia for three months. 
but his promise is to end the fight. Hoffman, keep the flame of freedom burning. Vote pro-choice. Tonight, he's an American screen icon. Who that? Wendy First in the biggest voting districts in the land. Joining us from the ballot room in the Balsam's Grand Hotel in Dixville Notch is Tom Tillotson, the town clerk. His counterpart in Los Angeles County is Charles Weisbert, register, recorder, county clerk. He's joining us from the headquarters of the Polls Division in the City of Commerce. I thank you both for being with us. Tom Tillotson, let me start with you. You have 30 voters. Do they all vote or do you have some absentee? Uh, we'll have a few absentees. Uh, it's, it's vacation time up here and a few people are away, so we have to track them down and get absentee ballots to them. All right, but all those who are going to vote, they actually show up at midnight? All 19 of them. 19 we'll will actually show up, okay. Will actually show up here at midnight. And, and how many polling places, uh, polling booths do you have for them? Exactly, 19. <laughs> Everybody has their own, huh? Yes. That, that's how you get it done so quickly? Uh, efficiency is our, uh, is our aim in this election. Yes, that's how it's so fast. <laughs> Andy Warhol used to talk about 15 minutes of fame. Dixville Notch, it's their one uh, moment of fame every four years on Election Day, right? Yeah, it's more like 15 seconds. <laughs> Any doubt who's going to win in Dixville Notch? Um, I think I wouldn't dare to uh, predict it right at the moment. Uh, well, the Republicans usually win up there, don't they? Generally, uh, I would expect this election to go for Bush. And does that give him any momentum nationwide? Well, we may give him momentum, but it's going to be up to him from, the, from here up there on out. You'll just have to do it himself, huh? Yes, that's all, right. all we can do. All right, Mr. Mr. Weisberg, let me ask you. Now, Tom has 30 voters. How many do you have? Uh, we have 3,750,000. 3.7 million. million. What, what percentage right. of the national vote is that? Uh, that's about 3% of the vote for president. 3% in, that, in the one area. Now, he was mentioning that he has 19 booths and 30 voters How many? and one polling place. How many polling places actually exist in your jurisdiction? We have 6,000 polling places and, how many? and we have 50,000 booths. 50,000 booths. Now, now you, you actually don't use voting machines, as I understand it. Is that right? No. We, are, we use a vote recording device. W what, does that, what does that mean? Uh, let me show you. Yeah. It's a simple device. I wish we had 50,000. And we use a punch card, IBM punch card. Right. A person goes into the voting booth, punches out their candidates or measures, and when they get through, they take out their ballot card. Well, pushing those holes that you just did makes holes in, the, in, the, uh, in that card that you've got. Correct. Right. And the, the cards uh, show the holes here, and the uh, ballots are deposited in the ballot boxes, and uh, that's what we count on election night. Now that, so they all have to be counted by computer or by, uh, yes, by computer, I would suppose. By computer, correct. Yeah. And how long does that take for 3.7 million voters? About three to four hours. So, so Dixville Notch comes in with their vote about 10 minutes after it's cast, and it takes you uh, a few hours to do. About 2 o'clock in the next morning. All right. So tell me, each of you, is sort of interesting, since you're all part of what is a magnificent national process, uh, and yet it's all over so fast. And w what happens to Dixville Notch on, on uh, Wednesday, Mr. Tillotson, after your 15 seconds of fame? Uh, we go back to being a small town in the mountains in Dixville, in New Hampshire. The, uh, having uh, participated once again in the election and and as you say, it's another four years until we do it again. And, and how about you, uh, Mr. Weisberg? I, I, I suspect, uh, given the, the size of your operation, uh, things don't gear down, actually, uh, right after the vote's over. No, uh, we have three weeks for an official canvas where we audit all the polling places and count the last-minute absentee ballots and do everything else we need to do to certify the election. Well, I, I thank each of you. It's very interesting. Uh, you, are the, you are the small, you are the large, and yet it's representative of the fact that, that there are literally uh, hundreds of thousands of people who uh, volunteer on Tuesday who are out in the polling places uh, working and uh, supervising the vote, and it's a magnificent process overall, and we thank you both for being here as representative of, of what will happen then on Tuesday. Thank you both. It is now uh, 16 minutes before the hour. The Perot Factor and the Electoral College when Good Morning America continues.
Mind. You have a deep, penetrating, agile mind. You are quite psychic and never miss a trick. You enjoy... In Sister Act, own a little piece of heaven. At the same time, one cannot deny that the banks are being a lot more conservative. It comes with Cadillac... Oh. Making the political speech. I put some coffee. The latest vehicle from GM has no moving parts. It uses no gas. It's made entirely of plastic that turns into steel. The new GM MasterCard. Every time you use it, GM will credit 5% of your purchase toward a new car or truck from GM. That could mean hundreds, even thousands of dollars in savings over and above any other discounts or rebates. And there's no annual fee. The GM card. The new financial vehicle. 45 minutes after 7, we learned about it in civics class, but I think every four years we all need a little refresher course on the Electoral College. That is the 538 Americans who really elect the next president. And Hal Bruno, political director of ABC News, joins us to explain how it works and what impact Ross Perot may have this time around. Nice to have you back here. Morning, Joe. How does this whole thing work? Okay, it was set up by the founding fathers who were trying to find a way to make sure that an election would be decisive. So after trying various things, they came, settled upon the Electoral College so that when you had an election, if you had a lot of candidates, you'd be sure that one of them would clearly be able to be declared the winner. And they created this idea that for every member of Congress, plus your two senators, a state is given an electoral vote. So it's in proportion to the population. So California, which has 52 members of Congress now, plus two senators, gets 54 electoral votes. Nobody figured that 120th of the population would be living there. That's right. There was no California at the time they invented it. Anyhow, when you vote, you're actually voting for a slate of electors. In each state, the Republican or Democratic Party or an independent candidate puts up their slate of electors. So whoever wins a state takes all. It's winner take all. Yeah, each state goes with one vote for That's, one person. Yeah, well, no, e yeah. Well, no, no, not quite. Each state goes for the slate of electors. If, if, you, if you win a state by only one vote, you get all of them. That's right, okay. So it comes up with one person. Yeah. They say 270. 270, that's the magic number that you have to get in you order to do You've got to get a this? majority of 538. There's 538 electors. 270 is the majority. Whoever gets 270 is the winner of the election. So then which are the important states? Which are the key okay. battlegrounds then? Well, as it turns out, California. Sure, obviously. Uh, with 54, that's 120th of what you need. Uh, Texas, Florida are the next biggest. Then you've got New York, Illinois, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Exactly where the candidates are campaigning, incidentally, these days is that strip across the Mid-Atlantic and Midwest. Yeah, I've been hearing the Rust Belt that being yeah. the deciding little area. Yeah. Even though in recent years they've lost population and it's places like California, Florida, and Texas have picked it up. Still in all, you have a cluster of electoral votes in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, that, that really count. This is where this election is in part being decided. We've been hearing all morning that Ross Perot probably won't come up with a state, however. What, what effect might he have in a state like Texas? Okay. In a state like Texas, Ross Perot, who will not win a single state, had a powerful effect. He's made that state competitive by taking votes uh, taking support away from the president and giving Governor Clinton a chance to come in there and be competitive. So Texas is a toss-up state today because Ross Perot was there. We're hearing that Clinton has the most votes. What are his, what's the core of his support? Well, he started out with a tremendous advantage in that California, Illinois, and New York, three of the biggest states, uh, never were that competitive from the very beginning. The Bush campaign in effect gave up on those states uh, very early on in the campaign. So that's 109 electoral votes that nobody was fighting for. All right, and there's also a lot of uh, votes that are being cast, of course, for Senate members, uh, you know, the Congress. Are we going to see the coattails? I mean, it used to be that people could go in on the coattails of whoever was winning in the presidential election, but has that changed? Well, in some places, presidential coattails may help elect a senator, but there are some states where what the Senate candidates getting or this, the, the turnout that the Senate candidates attracting can help the presidential candidate. The electoral vote, as I understand it, doesn't take place, what, till December 14th, yeah, it's right? Yeah, it's the, the, what is it, the first Tuesday or something after the election, yeah. 
Well, once in a while, though, electors do change their mind, right? I mean, are they yeah. not supposed to? I mean, is it a given that they're not yeah. supposed to, but they can, and they have in the past? Well, it depends upon the state. Now, in about half of the electors are in states, a little more than half, are in states in which they are bound. They're not supposed to change their mind. But the rest of them are in states where they're free to do what they want. Now, they're supposed to vote the way they were uh, elected, you know. But then you have the case of the faithless elector yeah. who decides that regardless, he's going to vote, he or she will vote the way they want. Nine chances out of ten we end up with the same as the popular election. Oh, Only sure. once has it been different, right? Right. All right. Hal, thanks, Hal. Uh, clean energy source. The answer may be blown in the wind when Good Morning America continues after this from Mattel. Two to three lighter at the McKees Rocks Bridge. Route 28, uh, congestion uh, now right below the Shaler Waterworks down to the 31st Street Bridge. Three lighter at Chestnut, two to three lighter at Anderson. Parkway West is over the top and almost halfway along the far side of Green Tree Hill. East Carson very close to Bex Run Road and Irvine, two lighter at Greenfield Avenue. In the KDKA Traffic Tower, this is Jay Pochapin for West Penn AAA. And defied the predictions of the press and the polls. President Truman undoubtedly has sprung the greatest political upset. Truman won by two million votes, only a four and a half percent margin. But a political precedent was set. Blame Congress. Author and NBC political analyst John Chancellor. This has always puzzled me. If you've been there for a long time, as Truman had been in 1948, as Bush has been in 1992, you are really part of this. And the government is supposed to work cooperatively, and I think they ought to take the blame cooperatively. Mr. Nixon, uh, dismiss me as, I quote him, another Truman, unquote. I regard that as a great compliment. Truman was a spectator in the tightest presidential race in American history. In the early fall of 1960, John Kennedy was favored against Richard Nixon. We do have peace without surrender today. But Nixon campaigned hard, claiming he would stand up to world communism. Suddenly in the last week or so before the day, one felt a kind of uh, ebbing away of Kennedy's support. Arthur Schlesinger was part of Kennedy's inner circle. I think suddenly there was, people began to pull away from the adventure of, of Kennedy. Back again on uh, the deck of NBC News, Election Central. It was very, very close in every state and probably one of the most exciting election nights I've ever seen. Kennedy was not declared the winner until the next day. His margin of victory was only 118,000 votes. That's fewer than two votes per voting precinct. What kept the suspense going was Nixon's refusal to concede. He conceded the next morning, as I recall, and uh, that ended it. But uh, that was a, a, a more irritation over Nixon than real doubt as to who's going to win. In 1976, it was another Democrat, Jimmy Carter, challenging a Republican administration. We've got an even greater challenge between now and Election Day just to restore people's faith enough to go out and not only work for us, but vote on Election Day. So thank you. I love every one of you. President Ford stands for the little taxpayer, and President Ford is against the big tax spender. Ford lost by an even narrower margin than Dewey did against Truman, just over 2% of the vote. Now Campaign 92 is in the home stretch. Will Tuesday night be another nail-biter as the votes come in? I think it would be rather close in the popular vote, but I would imagine that Clinton will have a decisive margin in the Electoral College. And we're back in a moment with more on today, right after these messages. has always been great for taste. Problem is... Then cool air from the Pacific Ocean rushes in, making these windmills turn an average of about seven hours a day. Even though California leads the country in wind power right now, other states are just as windy, if not windier. 
Theoretically, in fact, harvesting the wind from the Great Plains states alone would go a long way to powering the entire United States. There's only one hitch. And the problem is taking that energy from that resource to where the people are located. And the problem is twofold. One is the economics of doing that, and the second is the construction of power lines and the opposition that uh, much of the public has for, against that. If engineers spend more time, and if utility companies spend more money perfecting the technology, then wind power could conceivably supply about 20% of this country's electricity by early next century. That would mean burning a lot less coal and importing a lot less oil. And that's not all. Wind power plants emit no air emissions such as fossil power plants. And also they provide jobs for this country not only in operating and maintaining the plant, but building plants uh, for the rest of the world because we right now lead the world in, in wind technology. As questions about energy and the environment grow larger every day, one might recall the words of songwriter Bob Dylan. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. And of course, none of that takes into consideration the amount of wind generated in the campaign. It's five before the hour. We'll continue in just a moment. The feeling of sudden impending change. As one paper wrote when they rejected... Three's ahead and Leon Harris... Is ...noticed uh, the bullet hole in, uh, in the light bar. Police and neighbors say the... <laughs> split in the Penn Hills energy. But you're just putting in your time waiting for the big... All the wait you can by Thanksgiving. For free. Per hour, Parkway West inbound over the top, Parkway... Don't release the man's identity. But the driver of the truck... what she wanted. Down the street and all over the greater Pittsburgh area. Cars and trucks are rusting out even in the 90s and despite what anyone tells you, they'll keep rusting out. Hmm. Prevent further outbreaks with a Z-Board Tidy Car Rust Protection Package at <laughs> one-third off. Save one-third on rust protection and protect a shine. Both for one-third off. You're just 278. See your Z-Board Tidy Car dealer now. This is Channel 11. Motown presents a shocking look at music's most mysterious family, the Jacksons, Sunday, November 15th on ABC. Oh, yeah. Things have a tendency to move very slowly with the good old boys in Congress. But that's not true of every congressman. In the last two years, Congressman Rick Santorum has held a remarkable 79 town meetings, and he's helped to solve almost 2,000 constituent problems. Rick Santorum has written over 30 pieces of legislation, including a health care bill, and he's even found time to close the House bank, demand the release of the names of the check bouncers, and expose a secret Speaker of the House slush fund. Oh, by the way, just like Rick's opponent, these old boys were rewarded with a hefty pay raise for their hard work. Rick Santorum gave his back. Join the fight to keep a congressman who understands what it means to go to work. Vote Santorum for Congress. If Madonna and the Pied Piper had a love child, her name would be Shusha. And you'll meet her exclusively on Entertainment Night. Tonight at 7. Now back to NBC. Wedding day. Back now, 8 o'clock on a uh, Monday morning, second morning of November of 92. And you're getting a shot from Madison, New Jersey, where President Bush has just been introduced to a crowd at what they are calling a one day to victory celebration. New Jersey, one of those states that the uh, Republicans would like to view as a battleground state that holds the key to tomorrow's outcome. Of course, Democrats would tell you the um, state is uh, safely in the Clinton column. The uh, governor has been holding a uh, lead there since day one, and it's expected to go for the Democrats. 
We're back in Studio 3B on this. Bill saying he can win, insisting indeed. Right now, we're going to check on something that no one can question, the weather, Mark. Weather from coast to coast. A new president will have to work with, and what shifts are expected on both sides of the aisle. Let uh. Look at the mood of the country on this day before. Is ticking down quickly on campaign 92 now. With one more day of crowds and speeches remaining, the major presidential candidates are all hoping to strike a triumphant note to end their campaigns. Bill Clinton was striking a few notes of his own in the wee hours of this morning in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The frontrunner ended a furious weekend by playing with a local band there. President Bush isn't going down without a fight. Although trailing in the polls, the president also is sprinting toward the finish line with a flurry of appearances. Even though Ross Perot is third in every poll, he is not conceding a thing. CNN's Tony Clark now takes a look at a defiant Perot on the campaign trail. For September 30th, this... Ross Perot has given this election year surprise after surprise. Sunday, he held up a copy of the famous newspaper headline, which wrongly declared Dewey winning over Truman, and said there's a similar surprise waiting on this election day. We're down to the two-minute drill. We got two days to go, and we're going to win all 50 states and drive everybody nuts. Yet despite enthusiastic crowds during this final campaign swing, polls show the Texas billionaire far behind. Even here in California, where supporters stood in line for hours to get a chance to see Perot, polls show he's only attracting about 15% of the state's voters. Well, the polls are completely wrong. They're way over 30. They're way over that. But I know what the polls are doing. They're lying. In Santa Clara, Perot claimed the Republicans and Democrats pay people to come to their campaign rallies. They can't get people to come to rallies because of patriotism and devotion and belief in the cause. They have to pay people to come to their rallies. I just have to say that with this great group here tonight. I know you've been here, some of you, since noon. I know you're worn out. A young person here today. And that's it, Mike. That is the, the hard core of his message for the last two weeks and for the la next last 24 hours, right up until the bo voting booths open. The president, very anxious to have any wavering voters come his way because he's still convinced a lot of people don't make up their minds till they're getting into the voting booth. And in that case, he says character is the issue that matters. Mike? I guess he really can sense, though, how this campaign is different from all the others in that at this time in this campaign, to think that a Republican was going to have to work this hard to win New Jersey is is showing something that's uh, a little bit amiss in terms of the Republican strategy here. Well, it's absolutely right. There are a lot of solid Republican states which are anything but solid this year. And that's why he's picking the states where he's going. He has to assemble just the right combination of electoral votes to beat the, the uh, floor of 270 votes. So there's a careful, there's a careful uh, concentrated effort to get him today in New Jersey, where Clinton was last night, Pennsylvania, where Clinton is this morning, on through the Midwest, like Ohio, and then into Kentucky and then Texas. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That's pretty much the way how Bruno had said months ago it was going to be from New Jersey West and Compton Live for us this morning in Madison, New Jersey. Now, if the Clinton campaign had a slogan for this last day of the campaign, it might be something like, head to the West and straight till morning. Clinton will drag his traveling press entourage over three quarters of the country today before ending up where they began a little over a year ago, in Little Rock, Arkansas. One member of the press corps, our own Ron Claiborne, spoke with us a short time ago from just outside Philadelphia. The Clinton campaign is, is pretty confident right now of where they stand in the electoral map, but to reinforce that position, they're going to be traveling to uh, uh, nine cities and a total of eight states, a 24-hour blitz starting in Philadelphia, ending up in Colorado. What they'll be doing is uh, telling voters their most basic message, that is that Bill Clinton is the agent of change, the, he represents change, and that George Bush is responsible for the ailing U.S. economy and that his time has run out. No worries about some of the late charges, the ROTC controversy that's erupted, no sense of, of concern about that? I think there is some concern that, that it may play with the voters who are undecided or worried about Clinton, but they're hoping that at this point most voters have made up their minds that they're going to go with him, uh, those who intend to go with him, and that they won't be shaken by these charges. Of course, nobody knows uh, whether that will hold or not. Give us a sense, though, of what it is like to be on the inside of this campaign as best as you can d describe it, Ron. Are these people really all that certain about where this thing is going to end up right now? 
as they tell it and uh, and just looking at them i think they're they're very confident that they they have this thing locked up um, obviously things can go wrong uh, voters may not come around that they expect to come around but looking at the electoral map they believe they have a base which brings them very close to the 270 electoral votes that they need to win and if they pick up just one or two states where they which are uh, undecided or on the edge right now that that'll put them over they feel very confident ABC's Ron Claiborne with the Clinton campaign this morning in Philadelphia. What about Ross Perot? Well, he unleashed a stinging attack on both of his presidential rivals. At rallies in California, Perot claimed that President Bush did not know that the uh, U.S. economy was in a recession. And he said that Bill Clinton doesn't have enough experience to run this country. Here's more on what uh, criticism Korea. he dished out. We left him in Vietnam. Do you believe that it's appropriate to have senior government officials who have used drugs? <laughs> It's up to you. When you've got a man that doesn't know there's, there's a recession in the country, he's responsible for running. When you and I know it and the newspapers have it in the headlines and he doesn't know it, I have to conclude this man does not understand business. As for his campaign day, Ross Perot has a rally scheduled in Dallas, and he also has another one of his infomercials that will be running tonight on network television. Other news for you on this Monday morning, another Boeing 747 cargo jet has lost an engine. This time it happened heading into the airport in Luxembourg, who won this morning. But this is a great little group of folks up here in Massachusetts, and this is the Whale Conservation Institute of Lincoln, Mass. In Great Lakes, through the mid-Atlantic and down into Florida, some of those rains could be on the heavy side, but we could see several inches of snow over some parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota, lighter amounts into Iowa, the Dakotas, and on, of course, into Ontario. Already four inches of snow on the ground in Minneapolis and mixed with a little bit of rain. Although a little bit farther east, what's happening in New York at LaGuardia Airport is a little bit of snow. Sleet is being reported along with rain. Binghamton, New York, is reporting freezing rain. You look at the western U.S., and they are not exempt. A low-pressure area tracking through the Rocky Mountains will bring rain and mountain snow to that region as well. By tomorrow morning, not much change in the picture. In fact, the snow seems to be more widespread across the Rockies and the northern plains in the upper Midwest as our rain moves slowly through the east coast states. By election day evening, this is the picture, could be some freezing drizzle uh, early tomorrow morning over some northern sections of New England as well. Snow will stretch from New Mexico on up into Michigan. I'll be back with a complete weather update in just a few moments. Right now, the news continues with Kathy Marshall. Some in Seattle are calling it a miracle. Others say it's a bad mistake. Whatever, a 68-year-old woman is alive this morning, a day after she was declared dead, and her body sent to a funeral home. A mortuary worker discovered she was still breathing. She was admitted to a hospital in serious condition. Well, jury has spoken, but the outrage... He's a fighter, so... Mr. Govina are declaring a... We have a front moving... New York City are furious with the jury's verdict. And, of course, we're talking about... Look at this up here. 62.8% back in 1960. It fooled around here. It went up to 53 and then all the way down to 50.1. What do you expect? I think uh, uh, another 10 percent, uh, 55 to 60, close to 60. 55. If the weather holds, the weather's terrible today here in Washington, but if the weather's beautiful tomorrow, uh, I voted in the district on Saturday, and there are a lot of people voting early because I'm going to be in Little Rock uh, going down there tomorrow, but I think that... Um, is that a, does that mean you've picked the winner? Uh, well, I've, I've tried to pick the winner, and who I predict the winner, the voters have to pick the winner, but uh, I think that uh, it's uh, weather, I think it's, how can you, 100 million people watch this on, on television? Uh, everybody talks about it at work. I don't care what you do for a living. I don't, I don't know anybody that hasn't been talking about it. How can you go to work Wednesday morning and say you didn't vote? I just think it would be impossible to tell your co-workers you didn't bother because there's such an opportunity. By the way, if you see the ballot, it blows your mind. It's not just, it's very democratic because you find Clinton way at the bottom and you find... Reads of rain, a high of 58. That's a national forecast. Now here's a look at your weather. 52, and then a bit more sunshine for tomorrow and even milder with a high of 60 degrees. More election eve and election day weather in the next half hour. Have a nine five fifty five. The region with Jewish and today's USA Today is for John Hagelin. That's what I'm National talking Law about. Party. He's right there in the middle. Uh, there's five or six of those candidacies, and they could all draw together at least one percent. This is in addition to Perot. I mean, you can go much further out than Perot. Mona yeah. Charon, the the numbers in almost every other industrialized country for voters, 65, 70 percent. We're going to be at 55 maybe if Chris Matthews is right. How come we're so low? Well, I've always, been, um, I've always been a contrarian on this subject. I, I think that the low voter turnout probably signals
contentment with the general state of things more than it does apathy or, or uh, disenchantment. A kiss to fill a dream of. This is a unique course. You want to tell us? I know you broke the students up into teams. And they but he doesn't have a good chance. I mean, it, it, it's really very difficult. He's got to win all the battleground states uh, that we've heard about. Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey, Georgia, North Carolina, maybe even uh, Iowa and Pennsylvania as well. So he has practically no margin for error. I think there are two reasons why he could win, uh, though it's, uh, it's not odds on. One is I think there is a hidden Bush vote out there, people who are afraid to tell pollsters there for this politically incorrect man, George Bush. And secondly, some of the pro vote is going to split off in the polling pay, uh, place tomorrow, and, and it may go to Bush, may not, but at, le at least uh, that's a vote in flux, so Bush has a chance. I think you're catching my disease this morning. I can't seem to put more than two words together either. Bob Beckel, is Fred Barnes dreaming? Uh, well, I know he's not drinking because he's a clean living guy, but boy, I'll tell you, that analysis is a stretch. The problem right now for George Bush is he's out of states. There are not enough states out there now for him to put together for an electoral majority. The West Coast is gone, the Northeast is gone, the Midwest is pretty much gone, and now Clinton is breaking into his base in the South and even maybe in the Rocky Mountain West. So right now it's a daunting task for George Bush, and, and I think for all intents and purposes, I, I don't want to jinx this, it's been too long, but I think this one's over. Bob, how much did Ross Perot hurt Bill Clinton over the weekend? <clears throat> oh, I think he hurt uh, some, but in the final analysis, Paul, I think he probably hurt George Bush more. I think when we finally look back at this race, we're going to find out that at the base core of the Perot vote, they are basically Republican, suburban, white voters that normally vote Republican. And so I think probably uh, it probably hurt George Bush in the long run more than Bill Clinton, although that, that commercial last night was just uh, that attack on Clinton was absolutely outrageous. But this is an outrageous guy. Fred Barnes, don't those very personal attacks have to... Angola today, just hours after Tory's success... ...record, Arkansas's environmental record, its economic record? Well, I think they have to hurt him, and in fact, uh, up to now, uh, Pro has mainly concentrated his fire on George Bush. Uh, it's bound to help some concentrating it on Bill Clinton, and it may steer this group of pro voters who are going to peel off on election day because they want to pick a winner they want to go with, the, with either bush or clinton they don't believe ross perot when he says he can win uh, it may steer them to bush now look i i'm uh, i don't think i'm dreaming on this but this is a long shot i don't want to pretend like uh, bush is odds on going into election day bob in the beginning it looked like over the last couple of weeks president bush was getting some mileage out of raising the trust issue in the end will that issue have served him well or not well, I think it was the only thing he had to talk about, Paul. But two things happened to him. First of all, I think we overanalyzed this movement of Bush last week in the polls. That was basically Republicans coming back home to vote, which we expected, at least I did, all year long. But secondly, I think the damage from the Iran-Contra story on Friday uh, is probably much bigger than we first assumed. I think it, it, it slowed down George Bush's momentum a lot. And it gave Bill Clinton at least some way to neutralize the trust issue. And if you, get, if you neutralize that issue and you get it back to the economy, the real issue is, do you want four more years of this? I think that's what voters are saying. And their answer is, no, let's move on, let's change. So trust was an important issue, but it got interrupted by Iran-Contra. And frankly, I think it did not serve George Bush well over the weekend. Fred, did the, the president, uh, did anything more than being distracted happen on Friday when, when the new issues were raised of his involvement in the Iran-Contra controversy? Well, I, I think it did slow Bush's momentum. Uh, Bob said uh, Bush didn't have any momentum, and then this came along and slowed it. Well, in fact, he did have momentum, and it changed the news story. It put the focus back on the Bush presidency. The good thing that had happened to Bush was a couple weeks ago, uh, the press had been talking about the Clinton presidency and Clinton's mandate and who'd be in his cabinet, and all of a sudden people started wondering, do we want Bill Clinton to be president? They didn't think about Bush's presidency, they started thinking about Clinton's. This made it shift back to Bush's presidency, and that really did slow his momentum. Fred Barnes, you want to make any Election Day predictions? Well, it's a long shot for Bush, but I'm sticking with him. Bob Beckel? Yeah, it's going to be uh, well over 300 electoral votes, and I think Bill Clinton's going to do better than people think of the popular vote, maybe 46 to 48 percent. All right, Bob Beckel, Fred Barnes, nice to see you guys as usual. Me too. Harry? It is 16 minutes after the hour, next in the stretch drive with the Perot camp. And tomorrow, watch CBS This Morning for the last word before you vote. Take beautiful smiles for granted. Take your child to see the dentist regularly.
Children's Hospital, celebrating the future of our children for kids' sake. Remember, and if you elect me president, you will be better off four years from now than you are today. Average family income down $1,600 in two years. You will be better off four years from now than you are today. Family health care costs up $1,800 in four years. You will be better off four years. The second biggest tax increase in history. If you elect me president, you will be better off four years from now than you are today. Well, it's four years later. How you doing? It's Thanksgiving morning, and this is your table. Your kids are still asleep. Today is supposed to be a day of plenty, a day for turkey and all the trimmings. You know today won't be like that for your family. Imagine how you'd feel. Help make this Thanksgiving Day a happy one for every family. Just $10 will put a turkey on the table of a family in need. Please send whatever you can share to KD Turkey Fund, Post Office Box, Thanks, Pittsburgh, 15230. On my next Vicky, meet some women who really knew Elvis intimately. So I didn't kiss him on the first date, but I did on the second. From his first date to his last lover. He actually gave me a, a white Lincoln Continental. What'd uh, you have to do to get the car? They knew the king like no one else. They give you gifts like he gave to Kathy? He gave me a house. That's all. Oh, well, like, ah. <laughs> on Vicky, Monday morning at 10. Seventeen minutes after the hour, Ross Perot targeted California over the weekend, and despite the polls, he still says he can win. And our Scott, Scott Pelley joins us this morning from Los Angeles with the Perot story once again. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Harry. Ross Perot's self-styled, world-class campaign comes to an end today with a final hometown rally in Dallas. After months of flirting with the campaign, and then dropping out, then appearing only on TV, Perot went into this weekend with a real old-fashioned campaign. He called it the two-minute drill. Who owns this country? Are you ready to make the words made in the USA the world standard for excellence? All of us have one purpose in mind, and that's to clean up this mess and pass on the American dream. Coast to coast in two days, a final against the odds push. With this tour, Perot sought to show once and for all that he is no quitter and that his campaign is real and viable. We're down to the two minute drill. We got two days to go and we're going to win all 50 states and drive everybody nuts. This was the populist billionaire at his most outrageous. He predicted a landslide victory, promised to have solutions to the nation's worst problems in just seven weeks. Rarely did he talk about those solutions, but when he did, they were radical. Perot advocated human experimentation for new AIDS drugs. Let me just put it in plain talk. If I'm going to die anyhow, I'd just as soon die trying to be cured. He proposed life sentences for armed robbers. If any human being in this country ever uses a gun to intimidate others, like in a holdup, or ever uses a gun to inflict violence on another person, we ain't gonna see him on the street anymore ever. Mostly, Perot was on the offensive. Saturation bombing, he called it. And there were plenty of now, targets. Thing, Governor Clinton. Here we got the chicken man from Arkansas. President Bush. If Bush understood money, he never would have run up a $4 trillion debt. And the media. Does anybody have a significant question? Or is this going to be the usual mindless press conference? If it is, I'm going to bed. Perot was greeted by his biggest crowds ever. Loud, enthusiastic. They forgave him for quitting in July. I think that's irrelevant. and I think what he was sick of the system. This is the first candidate that I've ever seen that's worth voting for. This guy has got the message that this uh, country needs. I'm crazy. And everybody that supports me is crazy. And we got a room full of crazies here today, right? Despite the efforts of the all too short two minute drill, Perot appears stuck in third place, distant third. So what is driving him? In Tampa, he suggested it could simply be a burning desire to clear his name. 
When I go to bed Monday night, there's just one thing that's important to me, and that is to feel that every one of you who worked so hard to put me on the ballot feels that that, say whatever you say about that guy, he did give us a world-class campaign. And Scott, this world-class campaign has cost some world-class money. What's the, what's the total so far? At least $60 million, Harry. Perot reminds everyone everywhere he goes that he's spending his own money, not taxpayer dollars. And it's coming to about $3 million a day now. Still, that may not be such a significant to some to someone who is worth over $3 billion. Are we going to see uh, Ross Perot on television again tonight? Yes, you will. In fact, it'll be hard to avoid Ross Perot on television tonight. He has purchased time in prime time on all three major television networks. It's his last-ditch attempt to make his appeal to the nation. It's been interesting uh, to watch all of this. What has it been like at, at these rallies? And, and uh, are you surprised at the number of people that are, are, are still showing up? Well, Perot was careful to go to the states where he is already popular, states where he's always been popular. Florida, California, Colorado, Kansas, for example. The crowds have been very large and very enthusiastic. These are the diehard people, and they were very glad to see their man finally in person after watching him only on television for so many months. Is there a place where Ross Perot has even the slimmest possibility of even nudging either uh, George Bush or Bill Clinton, a single state? Could Ross Perot come in second anywhere? It is possible. States where that might happen are in the West, including Alaska, for example, Utah, Nevada, Washington State, Colorado. Possible that he might come in second in one or more of those states. Not terribly likely at this point. Scott, you live in Dallas. Uh, Ross Perot lives in Dallas. Uh, folks there have had a, a, an interesting sort of a roller coaster affair with him over the years. How is he playing a, in Big D right now? Well, he's a bit of a folk hero. He took on the Texas education mess. He took on the drug problem in Texas. He's playing very well in Texas, and today's rally is likely to be huge. Scott Pelley with uh, the Ross Perot campaign in L.A. this morning. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Paula? Thank you, Harry. 23 minutes after the hour. Stay with us and find out what's new and strange on Northern Exposure. Subway 70... Bread. Recently... Not that one. Carnation Instant... Clinton is raring to go, trying it all over. Program uh, play date. Yeah. You may be right, and you know, it's, it's, the Democratic Party is going through a, as you know all the players like I know them. There are a lot of people in the Democratic Party like Rob Shapiro and Al Fromm, who are the Democratic Leadership Council people who have per, been leading this rump uh, rebellion for, for almost a decade now, ever since 1984. And they have a candidate now, the chairman of the, of the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council. They have run against the Democratic Party establishment. Clinton and those people talk more like Kemp than they talk like Bush. They do. Not in this race, though. No, maybe not in this race, but, but I'll tell you, the people he's going to bring in, I think, I hope, by the way, it's always a bet. Yeah, and he it's also, he also takes advice from Derek Shearer, who's a socialist. I agree. Let me well, read one more I don't paragraph. think you call both on the socialist. <laughs> no, but the Shearer, it certainly is. One more paragraph of Maureen Dow's article, and we'll get off this. <clears throat> and I want, before we do that, I want to ask you, you said President Bush is a good guy. Individually. Individually. Yeah, if I, he'd make... be a great father, he'd probably be a great grandfather. People who know him, I've met him a few times, um, three or four times, I've always found him to be a decent, nice guy, I a just, real person. I want to know whether or not Mona Charon thinks that Bill Clinton is a good guy, in the same way that... One to one. I've never met Bill Clinton, uh, and uh, don't know. Okay. While Barbara Bush was on the train, Mr. Bush tried to exercise some restraint, but as soon as she dropped off at dusk, the president began calling people bozos again. <laughs> I won't read any more of this article, but I just wondered what you... Great. Well, she's, why the great is thing it? about her is she seems like she's... It's like an onion. The more you peel it, the more you get Barbara. I mean, it's, she's always Barbara. All right. Or he is different at different levels, I have to say. Great, grapevine in, in Time Magazine this week. So far, 170 congressional candidates have accepted California Republican hopeful Tom Hunings' invitation for new members of Congress to meet in Omaha on November the 23rd to fashion a House reform agenda. You know about this? No, I've heard that they were sort of getting together. That's pretty official. Hmm. Not a chairman. Is he a Democrat or Republican? He's a Republican. Interesting. Uh, 
Even though Cuning may not win, both parties are rattled by the notion. House aides deny any connection with, when, uh, with the Huning summit, but Speaker Tom Foley will effectively preempt the powwow by traveling next week into Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Chicago to meet with all Democratic winners. His agenda, new committee assignments, and coincidentally, reform. Okay, who is this? Who's traveling out there? Mr. Foley. Oh, Foley. Big surprise. He used to work for a speaker. Sergo, no, though, this is, this is a classic battle between the new members and the establishment. And they always, the establishment tends to win after a little bit of brokering of a deal. There'll be a deal broker. The new guys will get some. New people will get something out of this. They better get something out of it in terms of reform. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see them get rid of the seniority system, but fat chance, you know. Well, you know, uh, Vin Weber says that a um, uh, Republican congressman who's not seeking re-election uh, says that he, he sees a lot of um, new candidates out there who have all been campaigning against uh, the, the House Bank. And the Steelers be cloudy, breezy, period. Good morning to you, is it? A jury finds a Waynesburg man. Cool. Prognosticator Charlie Cook in roll call says uh, he's got a guide to watching the early returns on election night. Right. And uh, he says that, uh, as you know, most polls close or they open at 6. They don't all open at 6, but most do, and most of them close 6, 7, or 8 o'clock. He says, looking for how Democratic incumbents might fare <clears throat> through the balance of the evening, watch closely what happens to representatives Frank McCloskey of Indiana, Ron Mazzoli of Kentucky, Richard Ray of Georgia, Steve Neal of North Carolina, and Mary Rose Okar of Ohio. What do you think of that? I disagree well, with that. I think, I think each one of those races has individual features. Mary Rose Okar bounced a lot of checks. Uh, you know, the, her, her situation is, uh, is unique. I, wouldn't, I think it's, this is a very tough year for <clears throat> predicting you know, partisan outcomes because there's such an anti-incumbent mood that cuts both ways against both incumbents. Says, well, I think it's going to be just like the governor's races were two years ago where you could, all, the best bet was to bet against the incumbent, yeah. and not regardless of party. The incumbent who had raised taxes in the governor's well, okay, case. Okay, but that, generally <laughs> incumbents are blamed for anything, but I think that I, I think that's an interesting bunch of races. I also think, you know, Tom Danny has a tough race, Pete Cosmeyer has a tough race, in Massachusetts, Joe Early, um, of Lewis. Uh, there are a lot of close races. If those guys all survive, then New it isn't... Gingrich? New Gingrich has a close race. I think and there are going to be a lot of interesting... I think the Democrats are going to lose 10 or 15 seats in the House. The Republicans lose 5 to 10 in the House. There'll be some brand names going down. There are already brand names going down. Vanderjack, Mickey Edwards, uh, Bro Anthony, uh, Chet Atkins. People we all know in this town are losing this... are going to lose tomorrow. Famous people are going to lose tomorrow. Shocking. Um, Shocking. We're, we're going to go to the phones in two minutes. Uh, November the 4th, Wednesday morning. And we can do more of this as the hour goes on. We're going to get to calls. Bill Clinton wins. We'll do the same thing with George Bush. What will the town be like? What will be going on in everyone's head here? Oh, there, will the be, there will be wailing, gnashing of teeth, and general mourning in Washington, D.C. if George Bush is reelected. Among all of the elite who run this city, there is no question that they are ready and primed for a Clinton victory, and they will be absolutely devastated if Bush wins. What Obviously. Republican conservatives will feel, I think, it depends on which ones you ask, but I think most will feel a sense of relief uh, that, that we're not going to have, that we're not going to have uh, the Democratic Congress and Democratic President riding roughshod over, uh, over America for four years. Well, what's uh, going to happen, Chris Matthews? Well, if, if the President pulls an upset, um, I think Dan Quayle will be ecstatic because this will guarantee his chance to be probably the nominee in four years. A good chance of getting the nomination where it'll be much harder otherwise. Uh, the other guys, it's hard to figure. It's hard to figure how it's going to affect Bill Bennett, Jack Kemp, uh, Bill Weld. Uh, the other Republicans, and Moni knows better than I do, about who, who are looking for an opportunity to run against an incumbent Democrat, and who would like an incumbent Democrat to run against at least once and run against him the second time and win, if not the first time. Uh, I think the big thing, if Clinton wins, that's the second part of the question, I think the most important thing Clinton has to do is something that Kennedy did back in 60, is pick a grown-up as Treasury Secretary very quickly, very quickly, because his big vulnerability is not January 20th and beyond. His vulnerability is November 3rd and beyond should he win, because between November 3rd and January 20th, you'll have a lame duck president. And the markets, the money markets, the people who worry in New York, if you combine ideology with paranoia and a desire for revanchism, all those three categories of, of emotion, you could have a, a, a cauldron of death Name. economically. Oh, I, I don't think you could have true. three months of interest rates going through the roof unless it, he picks a strong uh, name. A, a no, no. Let, I got a call on the line, but I want to ask you name two grown ups uh, Paul Block or Felix Ryden. Uh, it won't happen, by the way, because the markets have already prepared themselves for either outcome. Moorhead, North Carolina, who are you going to vote for? I'm going to vote for Perez. Why? Well, I believe every, everything he is saying, and everything he's saying is what Jefferson said. The way our country is set up, and the way the people are supposed to run the government. And uh, uh, they are the bosses. 
And he's 100% correct. Now, there's one thing I have to bring up right now. It's something nobody's talking about. In the first presidential debate, uh, Bush said he was, his forte was foreign affairs. And he was going to appoint a baker to run the economy. We haven't heard one word from Baker as to what he is going to do. All right, thanks. What about that? Uh, Bush, Bush maintains the following. He says that if he is reelected with 100 new members in Congress, there will be a different atmosphere in this city and that it will be possible to push through some kinds of reform. Uh, investment tax credit, the uh, cut in the capital gains rate, uh, enterprise zones perhaps. You know, he, he does have, the irony is, Bush does have a more reformist agenda than Clinton is recommending. And, but he's never, I think Chris would agree with this, he's never really stood behind it and he's never really pushed for it. Um, if he were reelected and if he really pushed for a reform agenda, uh, he could do the country a lot of good. But let me just say this to the caller, the economy is already turning around. Whoever is elected tomorrow, uh, is going to inherit, basically, a, a structurally sound economy that's moving toward a strong, long recovery. Pearl River, New York, what's on your mind and who are you going to vote for? Well, I'm going to... Hello? Yes, sir. I'm going to vote for Perot. I'm not a Bush supporter, but I'd like to tell you something. Um, I don't think anybody in this country really cares whether it was arms for hostages, hostages or arms or whatever. It was some effort, whether legal or illegal, done by our government just to save some of our citizens, that's what it was. It wasn't somebody making money on the side selling arms, which it, it is today, it, it, and other things. The other, the other big issue, which is, I don't know who creates these issues, is what we did to Saddam Hussein before the war and this and that. Now, Saddam, <laughs> that's funny too, because whenever you give, why is it so important that uh, uh, whether somebody knew about it at a certain stage and whether there was dual use or something, it's not important. Whenever you give extra money to a compulsive gambler, instead of feeding his family with all the money he has, he's going to use that extra money for his gambling. Thanks. Well, I just want to answer the question, the first part. I, can, I don't want to talk about the second part too much, but this first part in terms of Iran, we have to remember that uh, Ronald Reagan won the election in 1980 because of, I believe, primarily because of inflation under Carter. That was the number one I that hurt him. That was the I word that hurt Carter most. But Iran was the symbol of, of weakness by Americans in the face of third world threats. And now to find that the president who attacked Carter. Well, in, 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 in the fact that uh, to then to turn around, to turn tail, having won an election saying you'd stand tall against the Iranian crazies, and then to turn around and give them what they want, which is more weapons, and let them use our people as hostages to get our weapons is, if not treasonous, a disgraceful. And I think that Bush, I don't care, there is no statute of limitations on this. Uh, I respect George Schultz, I respect uh, Cap Weinberger. I wish Cap Weinberger, by the way, wasn't being prosecuted for this. I think it's a joke that he's being prosecuted because he's innocent. He was on the right side of that policy. And I think that the American people shouldn't forget that Ronald Reagan ran as the symbol of John Wayne, that he was going to stand up to the Iranian crazies than they were at the time. Uh, and he ended up cutting a deal with him behind the American people's back, lying about it. And George Bush has been part of that lie for six years. He ought to pay politically for it. Now, it isn't the most important thing in the world, but if you're going to raise the issue of character and trust over and over in a campaign and talk about a guy's draft record of 23 years ago, the Democrats have a right, it seems to me, to raise an issue of, of a national policy six years ago. 23 years ago, a kid's decision to avoid the draft and how he went about it is valid information. We should know it about a person's character. But the person who raises that issue is vulnerable for their own behavior in, in a setting of national policy, which in, in this case was disgraceful. Chris, first of all, the fact is that the, Ronald Reagan was not elected just to stand up to the Iranians. He was elected oh, for many reasons. Me Interest rates were out of control. Inflation was out of control. The uh, United States had failed to stand up to the Soviet Union. Remember them as well? Um, uh, had lost uh, something like eight countries to communism under Jimmy Carter's watch. But never mind. The, the fact is, this controversy that you're so fond of, of going back to, the, the Iran-Contra... I Iran didn't bring it up. You did. Brian you, you, brought it up. I you've been, you've been, you've been filibustering about it. That gentleman brought it up. I responded oh, to it. Oh, listen. The fact is <laughs> that, 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 you know, you said something very interesting in your long uh, uh, treatise on this. You said, 
Cap Weinberger shouldn't be prosecuted. He's innocent. He was on the right side. Right. You are you are tacitly accepting the notion that it is okay to prosecute people for being on the wrong side of a policy or the right side of a policy no, dispute. No, it was a law. Ah, broke the but law. see, but that's not the case because no, the what you're saying is if you're law. against, no, it's it a wasn't. Policy and a law that as was a matter of fact, it wasn't against the law. To, uh, the uh, contra part was against the law. The arms deal was not against the to, law. To trade enemy, to it was not. It may have been bad policy, but there was nothing illegal about it. Do either one of you think the president? The arms control act requires these things be certified. See, there was, there had certified. to be a presidential finding. There was a presidential finding. When did we, where did we read this presidential finding? Where it's was it written the, down? It's part of the record, Chris. If you look back there is at the There's a public record, record of the president agreeing to sell arms to the Iranians. There is a, the president oh, was required by the law to, to issue a finding and so on, and he issued it, and it's all, it was all done legal. It was a bad policy move. It was not illegal. The, the contra part we can argue Either about. Either one of you think the president would consider a pardon for Cap Weinberger after the election? I think either president, whoever it is, should do that. I think it's a chance of some... <laughs> Tonight and watch it. <laughs> Terrific prices on... Mayor Kurt Schmuck, former New York Mayor Ed Koch, Congressman Vin Weber, diplomat and political scientist Gene Kirkpatrick, and Harvard University... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Crash. Thank you very much. Let me say, first of all, you can see that... I have nearly lost my voice trying to give you a voice in Washington on Tuesday. Teddy Roosevelt once said that we should walk softly and carry a big stick. Today I want to talk softly and carry Ohio. I want to say how delighted I am to be here with Senator Howard Metzenbaum and how much I appreciate the help he's given with Lee and Peggy Fisher, and I thank them for their leadership, with my dear friend Governor Dick Celeste, with your wonderful Mayor Mike White, and your great Congressman Lou Stokes. All of them have done so well. I also want to put in a special plug for a young man who's here running for Congress, Eric Fingerhut, only 33 years old, the kind of fresh blood we need in the Congress. And finally, let me say, I don't know everything Mike DeWine said in this campaign to set John Glenn off, but I don't believe I'd have done it if I were him. <laughs> That's the best speech I ever heard John Glenn give. Send him back to the Senate so he can give some more of them. I brought a couple of people with me today, and I want each of them to have a chance just to say a brief word, and then I want to say a few parting shots to Ohio. First of all, I'd like to introduce the best partner a person ever had, the next First Lady, Hillary Clinton. I just... I think it's wonderful the way the sun's coming out, don't you? <laughs> I just want to thank Cleveland. I want to thank all of Ohio. The way that you have received us from Cleveland to Toledo to Akron to Canton to Dayton to Columbus to Cincinnati, down way down along the Ohio River and Portsmouth and Athens and Utica. We are so grateful for your support and we want to win Ohio and then we want to come back to help you make Ohio the state it should be under a new president who really understands what's at stake in America. And now, I'd like to bring up here a person who has worked so hard with me and with many others to build a new, a stronger, a deeper, a broader Democratic Party committed to the future, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Ron Brown. Please. I feel the winds of change blowing in Ohio. I feel victory in the air. Four years ago, George Bush promised that he would be the education president. He didn't tell the truth. He promised he would be the environmental president. He didn't tell the truth. He promised that he'd create millions of jobs for our people here at home. He didn't tell the truth. He promised that he'd be kinder and gentler. He didn't tell the truth. And now the American people are saying George Bush 
it's time for you to be the former president, and that is the truth. Tomorrow, the American people are going to speak loud and clear. They're going to make George Bush a one-term president and put Bill Clinton in the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, a few days ago, I was in Georgia, where we had between 25 and 30,000 people in a high school football stadium outside of Atlanta black and white together, making the New South's commitment to a new future for America. I would like to introduce to you one of the most distinguished citizens of Georgia, Martin Luther King III. Please welcome him up here. Ohio, I'm glad to be here with our next president. Bill Clinton. Ohio is a great state, but to maintain your greatness, you must turn out in mass numbers tomorrow for the Clinton-Gore ticket. But I'm here secondly to refute a lie, a lie that is vicious and has been going across this country and many of our communities, a lie that the Bush quail team put out the lie that Arkansas has no state holiday honoring Martin Luther King Jr. I'm here to say that that is a bold-faced lie. Arkansas was one of the first states to have a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And I was glad to be there when Governor Clinton signed that legislation. And so I say to you very briefly, how long? Not long, Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, because no lie can last forever. How long? Not long, because God is on our side. Tomorrow, we're going to elect Bill Clinton, and we're going to elect Al Gore. Tomorrow, we will have a new president of these United States. God bless you. We've just seen and heard live coverage of a portion of a Bill Clinton campaign rally at the Burke Airport just outside Cleveland, Ohio. CNN's CNN Day Watch continues or begins after this. On Election Day, CNN encourages you to vote and to watch your vote count. Stay with CNN for continuous live coverage. Unity, a fight between blame and taking responsibility for ourselves and our future. A fight between the comfort of the status quo and the courage to embrace new ideas. Clinton's running mate Al Gore is trying to get out the vote in North Carolina. Gore says he is honored when President Bush refers to him as ozone man. Gore also gave the president's dog some dubious credit for Bush administration policies. But if I remember uh, the exact quote, he said uh, that his dog Millie knows more about policy than those crazy bozos. You know, I think it may have been Millie who taught him how to roll over and play dead where the economy is concerned. Win or lose, President Bush says today is the last day he'll be campaigning for himself ever. The president is now in Pennsylvania after holding a morning rally in New Jersey. His chase for electoral and popular votes will also take him to Ohio, Kentucky, and Louisiana. Bush ends his day where his political career began in Houston. During his last campaign hurrah, the president told his supporters to vote Republican and forget the media. Every one of you know that there has not been objectivity in the coverage. Every one of you know. <laughs> Every one of you know it. And they are, they're having their own debates, all these talking heads. Have we been fair? Well, this is the way we do it. That's the way we do it. And everyone knows that they're covering up the fact this has been the most biased year in the history of presidential politics. But we don't need them anymore. Vice President Dan Quayle says if the American people want change, they should change Congress. Quayle rallied voters in Chattanooga, Tennessee this morning. Tennessee is the first stop of his final six-state campaign dash. An independent candidate, Ross Perot, is winding up his campaign with a rally in Dallas and a TV commercial blitz. 
The Texas billionaire bought airtime on all three TV networks for today. Yesterday, Perot attended two rallies in California. In Santa Clara last night, he questioned Bill Clinton's qualifications to be president. He also took a swing at President Bush, telling Americans they would have to pay for his mistakes. If you look at Bush's economic plan for the future, it does nothing to get rid of for the deficit. And it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And all you college students out there are going to take it right in the teeth. Final day campaign blitz, stop one, New Jersey, a big battleground state worth 15 electoral votes. The president is hitting his Democratic opponent hard as he tries to win four more years in the White House. He is also repeating his predictions of victory. You know, you've seen some strange reports yesterday or day before they had Governor Clinton talking about his inaugural parade. My advice is put the parade on hold, Governor, because I am going to win this election tomorrow. The pundits don't matter. These national pollsters who have been all over the field, they don't matter. What Governor Clinton doesn't understand, it is the people in that booth tomorrow that matter. They won't, don't want somebody who's going to expand the American government. They want somebody like me who's going to expand the American dream and make life better for every young person here today. Meantime, the number two man on the Republican ticket, Dan Quayle, has stumped through 14 states since last Wednesday. He's hitting six more today, including Al Gore's home turf of Tennessee. Quayle is scheduled to overnight and vote in his native Indiana. Russ Perot is trailing way back in the polls, but he's still talking about scoring a big, big win tomorrow. Yesterday at a rally in California, he raised the image of a Trumanesque upset. After blasting both major party presidential candidates, Perot once again stressed the differences between his White House bid and more traditional campaigns. If we had any political handlers, and we don't, they'd be coaching me to try to just get 270 electoral votes. We're not competing just to get a marginal victory. We're competing for a mandate so that we can take our country back. Although Perot has made some public appearances in the final days of Campaign USA 92, he's underscoring his on-the-airwave strategy tonight. He will be bankrolling ads on all three entertainment networks. On this final day of Campaign USA 92, tomorrow, of course, the real stars of the Democratic system with a small d will take over the show. American voters will cast their ballots nationwide. Bill Clinton sprinting toward the finish line, still ahead in the polls. His final campaign tour is a test of endurance, covering about 4,100 miles, running for 30 hours. He has just about lost his voice, but the Democratic standard bearer keeps plugging his vision of why tomorrow's election matters. Thank <laughs> you.